interesting to uh, have the opportunity to speak a bit about uh, my interests in Jung and the work that I do, um, and uh, to do it in my library, which has been um, something that has been an expression of lots of ideas and feelings and history and connections with things that have interested me psychologically and emotionally and uh, spiritually over the years. Um, and um, the library has an interesting story to it that I actually did write about uh, in a book that I edited in honor of uh, James Hillman called Archetypal Psychologies. And in that book, I felt it was important to tell the story of the library, which I wrote about. And the story uh, happens uh, initially when uh, I was looking for a house that could hold the library. Uh, my book collection had grown considerably, and I wanted a space in which I could uh, spread out my books and interests. And um, I was uh, very interested in James Hillman's work. I had read uh, his Terry lectures in the form of Revisioning Psychology, which was a book that I found very provocative and interesting and original. And I very much wanted to meet uh, the man who wrote it. It was a book I wish I could have written because it combined a kind of phenomenological, archetypal Jungian perspective, but highly original twists and uh, descriptions. And so I wanted always to meet James Hillman, and one time I was going down to a, an original meeting, and they had a pool outside of the uh, uh, conference and I was taking a swim and uh, James Hillman happened to be in the pool and uh, I discovered who he was there and he was considering joining the uh, Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts and I was pretty excited about it and we started to talk and he asked me what was going on inside and you know, I mentioned to him that sort of uh, defensively and off the cuff, oh it's all political and uh, expecting that the soulful man would say, oh yes, and resonate with what I was saying, and on the contrary, he said, well, it's all political. And I was sort of shocked, and that was the beginning of a number of shocks that I was to have in working and learning from James over the years. It did turn out that uh, he did join into regional, um, and after I finished my analytical training, um, I decided I wanted to do some further work, so I analyzed with James for about five years after I finished my training and was able to learn a lot, not only about James Hillman and his ideas, but more about myself than I had learned so far. And then over the years, because we were in the same society and uh, there was an archetypal psychology movement, uh, I became involved in that movement with a number of colleagues and friends, which I also wrote about in the, in the book Archetypal Psychologies. And um, it was a really important period of my life to, uh, uh, to get to know Jim, not only as an analyst, but ultimately as a colleague and a friend, uh, going to the Aranos conferences, going to his birthday parties, uh, evaluating students together and candidates in the analytic training, uh, having meetings um, where we talked about cases and dreams and his approach. And um, uh, it was an important, uh, an important uh, addition to my own learning and training and uh, collegiality and friendship over the years until he died. Um, so the reason I'm mentioning Jim Hillman was that at one point I visited him in Dallas uh, when he was teaching at the University of Dallas and he invited me to his uh, home 
place I guess he was renting it. But in the building he was in, he had a little double-decker library. And it fascinated me that there was this uh, balcony with books and this double-decker library, and I asked him about it. And he said, yeah, I, I did it because it reminds me of my grandfather's house who had a double-decker library, a much larger one. And I grew up in that library, and I really remembered it and uh, appreciated it, liked it, and tried to replicate it in some way. So I didn't think much of it. I took that home with me, and when I was looking for a new place myself, I got a call from a realtor who I had told, if you ever find a place that has a place large enough for a library, let me know. So she called me, and uh, I came to this house uh, that you're looking at in the film, and uh, found a place for my library, which I built over the years, uh, and replicated uh, the way the house was. It was a big open room when I first purchased the home, but I knew about its uh, uh, history a little bit. You could see where the balcony had uh, uh, been in place, the second floor, and I restored it as best I could according to what I knew at the time. Well, eventually I invited James to talk here in Pittsburgh. We had a analytical training program here and I invited Jim to come down and give a presentation and he was staying with me and it was the first time he had been to the library and he came to the door and looked at the library and had a kind of strange look on his face and um, he said, is there a little room over to the side? And I was kind of shocked again and I said, yeah, how did you know that? And I said, I don't know, it's just, he said, I don't know, it's kind of familiar. And we chatted and talked and tried to put some things together. And I told him about what I did know about this library, that it was built by a reformed rabbi by the name of Leonard J. Levy. And he had this library built. And he started to ask me about that man, which I didn't know too much about. But he went home and talked to his family and discovered that Leonard J. Levy was a student of his grandfather who knew his grandfather's library and studied with him. And when he came to Pittsburgh, he built a replica of Hillman's grandfather's house and library. And this library turned out to be that replica, which was shocking to both myself and Jim Hillman. And so it always was a kind of bond uh, between us. Uh, the library was also replicated by, I think it's Delaware, Delaware Memorial College, I'm not sure of the name now, but uh, his grandfather was involved in, in that college and they built a replica of the library there too. So one day I went to visit uh, both the grandfather's library, James's grandfather's library, and the library uh, in the college just to see what they were like. And at the time I got to the house, it had all been torn down. Uh, the house was interesting because it was similar and I could see the library space. <clears throat> so I asked them uh, whether or not there was anything left of the library and downstairs some of the old shelves were still there. So um, uh, I asked if I could take two of the shelves, one for my library and one for James. And so I took a shelf and had a little plaque engraved on it from his grandfather's library and gave it to him. And it was a kind of bond between us over the years, a strange synchronicity or what to call it. Not sure that here this man who was my mentor and teacher analyst, um, uh, somehow or other I found my way to replicating uh, not only something I found that was important from his soul to mine, but in the physical world, the library itself. And so it was always a kind of amazing uh, experience. And I remember sitting in, in the library and gazing up and wondering about the meaning of the ancestors and the connections between people that are a bit esoteric and maybe beyond what we can really quite explain.
I did a book called The Black Sun, The Alchemy and Art of Darkness, and it had to do a lot with my passion and study and love of alchemy. Um, and um, the interest in alchemy I discovered uh, had a long childhood lineage, and that when I thought back about how I got involved in an interest in alchemy, um, I remembered uh, of course, Jung's amazing graphics in his books in the alchemical works, and that certainly stimulated something. But it goes way back to my own childhood, where as a very young boy, uh, maybe four or five years old, I used to collect stones. And I absolutely was fascinated by stones. They, they were something that was alive, but not alive uh, to me. Uh, something between me and the outside world. Uh, something that I love the different shapes and sizes of them. It was like a discovery of nature again and again like little jewels on the ground that I collected and put together in front of my grandmother's house. And collected these stones and I used to like to write with them on the sidewalk. I would scratch them and discover that some stones um, gave off just a scratch, just the thinnest scratch with no color. Other stones would uh, break easily but would be filled with color and different colors on the sidewalk. And other stones were sort of not too hard or not too soft but would give color but would hold together. And there was something about these different ways of being that I experienced not just in the stones but in life somehow. Those rigidity filled moments of life and people that are just scratch, scratch the surface. Others that give everything and fall apart. And those that had a more balanced, integrated capacity to both keep themselves in a kind of container, but yet express themselves richly and fully in life. And somehow all that was contained in stones. So they were psychologically alive for me in ways that I uh, never really understood at the time, but which stayed with me over the years. And I remember reading uh, Jacques Derrida's work where he talked about arche writing, that writing that we do that's before writing, not, not in some scholarly sense, but almost like an archetypal precursor to the expression of, of uh, uh, writing. And all that played a role in the continuing love of stones and the uh, power that they had over me. Uh, several years ago now, there was the recognition that uh, I had remembered that my name, Stanton, uh, came from uh, the roots of uh, that meant from the stone house. And that became an interesting further link. The stone image kept piling up in my life. And several years ago now, I completed a uh, doctoral dissertation in philosophy. And during that, uh, without any conscious realization, the uh, man who chaired my thesis, a Hegelian scholar, his name was Tom Rockmore. And, uh, on that committee was uh, a man, uh, uh, also a Hillman and Jung scholar, but a philosopher, Edward Casey, but he came from Stony Brook. And so these kind of linkages continue to develop uh, and sit in the background of my interest so that when I saw materials on the Philosopher's Stone, there was already this resonance about the goal of alchemy, the goal of life, uh, the achievement of some kind of larger sense of self. So anyway, uh, this color, interest in color, was also something that was important in alchemy. And when I was growing up, I developed an interest in chemistry. Um, and I couldn't wait to take, uh, I had a chemistry set when I was a kid, and I loved to make the color experiments where you uh, mix different chemicals together and they change from one color to another, or you add a solution like a phenothiolene to a colored solution and it went back to a normal color of water and would go through these amazing transformations. And in the little book, uh, they had a skill craft 
chemistry book that you could read experiments in, and in it it would talk about magic light stealing green from the grass and blue from the sky, and it was meant to interest kids in chemistry. Um, um, and so I looked forward to high school chemistry thinking it would be a kind of alchemistry, but much to my disappointment, um, you know, when it went into the natural science of chemistry and uh, the experiments of uh, uh, mathematics and uh, abstraction, uh, it was a disappointment to me. My, I was on a different wavelength. I was tuned to the kind of aesthetic and phenomenological and subjective um, uh, expressions, poetic expressions of the things that uh, brought passion to my interests. And so I started to discover my own biases in further learning about things, that somehow natural science was at some distance from what mattered to me as a person. And that kind of set the stage for an interest uh, that I had followed, um, you know, throughout my life so that when I came to uh, go into higher studies in my life, I was more drawn to philosophy uh, than uh, uh, the natural sciences and particularly the natural science of psychology, uh, which didn't carry for me the kind of more uh, uh, moving experiences that I had had in, in my childhood. And so I was drawn to not traditional psychology so much, but to a phenomenological version of psychology, uh, which ultimately interested me in Duquesne University to come to study psychology and phenomenology as a way of entering the experiential part uh, of psychology and that became for me uh, an opportunity to continue on what seemed to me to be a kind of illumination, a feeling of illumination that came with the experiences of stone, the experiences of the magic of transformation, the transformation of alchemy, the phenomenological approach to psychology, to philosophy, and these were all backgrounds for me as I also entered into a Jungian world and a Jungian analysis, which uh, uh, felt like a natural fit because of Jung's interest and passion in the uh, uh, quality of the symbolic life, that there was something about symbols and the meaning of symbols that for Jung was um, the best possible expression of something uh, as yet unknown. And it was that unknown quality, I think, that had stimulated my life from the very beginnings with stones, with transformations of color, with uh, alchemy, with uh, philosophy, phenomenology, uh, Jungian psychology. And it became a kind of thread in my life um, um, as backgrounds to my studies. I wanted to say something about uh, the fact that um, these experiences were also enhanced by a period of, of my life in the early days of psychedelic research where I got to know Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzner and uh, I was a student at Bard College which was up near Millbrook, New York and so as a student I went up to Millbrook and learned about what was going on there after Leary and Albert and uh, Ralph, you know, had uh, left Harvard, uh, left Zihuatana, Zihuatana, I think it was, Mexico, and uh, lived in the Hitchcock estate in this great big mansion where they were doing psychedelic experimentation. And I was a young kid from Bard, kind of a hippie kid who went, knocked at the door and tried to introduce myself and tell them about my interests, and uh, I remember Richard uh, Alpert, later Ramdas, uh, talked with me to kind of see if they were going to allow me to come and sit in on what was going on there. 
and we had a very interesting chat, and it turned out that we, um, uh, he invited me to join the group there, and I was on a, a, a break from Bard. They had a field period, a work period, so I joined the family and went and participated in some of the early psychedelic research. It was again an experience of a great deal of psychological uh, stimulation and power, really overwhelming power, uh, uh, at the time that I was there. And uh, I got to know them. It was a really interesting time uh, when lots of jazz musicians and poets would visit, come up from New York, psychologists, philosophers. It was a community that was so enthralling, I almost didn't go back to college. Um, uh, but then, at a certain point, I had um, an LSD experience that was so overwhelming that it was beyond uh, what I could manage psychologically. Uh, I guess what traditionally you might call a bad trip, although it had lots of good, good experiences in it um, for me. Um, and, uh, uh, but ultimately, it was so overwhelming that I decided to leave, leave the family. And they told me, well, before you do that, go around and talk to everybody and see what you think after talking and, uh, with people, which I did. Uh, but then I did decide to, uh, to leave. And um, I went home and I had a lot of, I guess what you would call continuing flashbacks with experiences of bodily kundalini rising and being out of control and my parents at one point said uh, you know you really should see a psychiatrist or see a doctor and uh, I went to do that and uh, I remember the doctor asking me to do a stick figure drawing uh, and I felt so totally out of communication with him that um, um, I decided that wasn't going to help me and I was pretty inflated and pretty up in my head and pretty um, uh, dismissive. Uh, but I had a passion for Asian thought and Asian philosophy. And in New Jersey, there was a Tibetan monastery with a very famous uh, Lama, uh, Geshe Wangal. And um, I went down to visit him thinking that he could be of some help to me. And when I went in the uh, monastery, uh, a monk came out and asked me where I was from and who I was, and I said, well, I'm from the high places, something like that, totally filled with my own inflation. And he looked me in the eye and he said, uh, too high, too high, uh, which shocked me, and uh, I had to do some thinking about that. And then the little Lama Geshe Wangal came out, and I was excited to see him, and I said, well, I've had this experience and it was overwhelming and I need some Tibetan help to help me uh, know what to do and uh, I said my parents wanted me to go see a psychiatrist and uh, Geshe Wangal looked me in the eye and said uh, oh listen to your mother and father and I freaked out and said what you know listen to my mother and father taking it very literally but then with a the powerful transference I had on to him I listened to it in a more symbolic way, and I thought, oh, listen to your mother and father, the archetypal mother, the archetypal father. And that really set me on a path that allowed me to start to reintegrate this rather overwhelming experience in my everyday life, which was a long uh, weaving together of the kinds of experiences I had with psychedelic drugs and uh, the experience I had with the uh, Lama and with uh, Asian philosophy going forward. Um, after I left Millbrook uh, and I went to school, I did, with Timothy Leary's encouragement, go to the University of Hawaii to get a master's and with a specialist in Buddhist philosophy, where I studied Buddhist philosophy and Hindu philosophy and was in a Zendo with Robert Aiken, who had become a Zen master, and Yastani Roshi and the Diamond Sangha there. And that was an important part of my early uh, academic development um, where my interests in Western and Eastern philosophy kind of came together. And I wrote on Heidegger and Nargarjuna and Jaspers uh, dealing with Heidegger's understanding of dying, what it meant to die.
which was an experiment uh, of the psychedelic life as well, the experience of dying and being reborn again and again and going under into the depths and re-emerging in ways that I had never imagined. But all that again set the stage uh, in another part of my life for my Jungian work and further, further philosophical and psychological work over the years. As I think now about the new work that I've been doing, I've published a number of papers, and I'm working on a book that's a, a furthering of what was left unfinished in The Black Sun. And in The Black Sun, I had explored the meaning of darkness uh, and the shine of darkness itself, uh, meaning that there was something illuminating in the ability to go deeply into the idea of the black sun, the negredo of alchemy, and to discover there an odd kind of light, a light that comes when one doesn't escape darkness or push away from it or run too quickly away into the light or to leave darkness behind, but to enter the darkness and to find there something that was illuminated and something ordinarily bypassed because of the difficulty of the dark parts of our lives, our depressions, our psychopathology, all our struggles. And going into them opened up a new kind of space. But in the Black Sun, I was interested in the light of darkness itself, but I leaned toward the darkness and explored that as phenomenologically uh, and in a Jungian way as I could. But now I realize that I wanted to now do further work on that darkness, but to lean toward the light side of it, not to leave the darkness behind, but to focus on what the nature of illumination itself was about. And that took me back to this earliest story where I started to review my life, where I remember the illumination of the stones, the colors, the illumination of the chemical experiments and the transformations that took place, the illumination that followed me through all the different interests I had, through psychedelic drugs, through Jungian analysis, through Buddhism, through Hinduism, through spiritual disciplines, uh, and the working out of now a book that is in progress called The Philosopher's Stone, The Goal of Alchemy, the Philosopher's Stone, The Alchemy and Art of Illumination. And so that book gathers the things that I've been talking about, but uh, in a more uh, scholarly way than I've been speaking about it today, in a more personal way. But these are some of the backgrounds that led you know, to the development of both my analytic and scholarly interests over the years. I remember how important dreams have always been to me in terms of becoming uh, uh, inner both critics and supporters, the inner analysts, the inner figures of dreams, the things that dreams can tell us. Dreams have also been a really important aspect of my work and I continue to write about dreams and include dreams in my published works. But one dream was uh, particularly interesting that I did write about. I can't remember the paper at this point. But it had to do when I visited um, Jung's home for the first time. I was teaching in Zurich about the Black Sun. And I had taught at the Institute. And I remember visiting Jung's house for the first time. And I was able to go into Jung's alchemical library, into his library. and. Um, take a look at all the books that he had uh, collected and studied and written about from the Rosarium Philosophorum to the Artis Auriferae uh, and to actually have those books in my hands. I was very excited and I remember looking through the books and studying and writing notes and when I was working on my own stuff. And 
after leaving <coughs> Jung's, Jung's library and teaching in Zurich and seeing all the uh, Bollingen for the first time and Jung's carved stone and immersing myself in Jung's world, I remember having a feeling uh, of wanting to have something of Jung's to bring home that would bind me to this experience and to Jung. And I remember picking some stones up off of the driveway and taking them uh, with me. And I don't remember now whether it was while I was still in Zurich or after I got home I had an important dream that I would like to mention. And the dream was one of going to Jung's house. And I went up to the side door of Jung's house and knocked at the door. And Emma Jung came to the door. And I tried to explain who I was, that I'm an admirer of your husband, I'm a Jungian analyst, and I'm here visiting. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, it's hard for me to ask this, but I wonder if you could give me anything of Jung's that I, you know, could have. And she says, well, wait here. She went in the house, and I'm really filled with anticipation, standing at the side door, wanting to bring home this connection with Jung that uh, meant so much to me. And she comes to the door, and right at my feet, she lays down a pair of Jung shoes. And I look at the shoes, and I step into them, and they're way too big. And so I had to find my own feet, my own shoes, and that was one of the lessons of being a Jungian, not to be identified with Jung or to imitate Jung, but uh, the critique of the Im imitatio Christi that he talks about, not to imitate, but to find your own individuation, to find your own soul, your own stone.